Well, thanks again, Jane, and thanks to Matt and Melanie and colleagues at RLUK for organizing, um, not just today, but um, what really is a wonderful series um, to host a dialogue around uh, the future. Um, there's a lot of discussion around uh, the issues we're facing today, um, things that we've done in the past and, and how to improve those. But I find that the Digital Shift Forum is unique um, because it allows us to carve out time um, to step outside of our day jobs and think about um, how can things look differently in the future. Um, and so I'm grateful for uh, this opportunity and for the forum itself. Um, well, today, my hope is to have a conversation uh, about future-proofing the research library. Um, the term future-proofing uh, is one that um, I've um, sort of identified with uh, to think about a verb that captures um, how to prepare for the unknown and how to prepare for uncertain events. Um, it was sort of serendipitous that uh, COVID-19 has sort of impacted uh, us and caught us off guard um, in 2019, in 20, um, March 2020. But um, this now is forcing us to have um, uh, a conversation um, about how to prepare for the future. And um, I hope to share some of the findings from uh, conversations that we've had with libraries around the world over the past three years um, with a lens on how all of this impacts our talent strategy. Um, the people are, in my view and many others, the most important asset and contribution to our uh, entire organization. Um, and to have a strategy uh, that considers how do our priorities and our budgets and um, our initiatives and strategic directions uh, support uh, preparing our people for 2030 and of course beyond. Um, so without further ado, allow me to begin with a short background on myself for those I haven't met. Um, my career began in 2007 after graduating college. Um, I immediately moved to Silicon Valley where I worked in the software industry uh, and specifically Mountain View, California. And it was while there I met colleagues at Ex Libris who recruited me to move to Boston. Um, 2010 was when I first um, became aware of the um, global library industry. Um, I had used the library as a patron, but never considered that there was such a, a, a rich and robust um, ecosystem of, of, of research institutions and, and suppliers and vendors. Um, but Ever since then, um, I've been enamored with the work that we do. And uh, despite many opportunities to leave, um, I always um, find new inspiration to, to, to stick with libraries and figure out ways to help them accomplish their, their mission. Um, and two years later, I was still at Ex Libris, but I began on the side working on a startup called applyful.com. Um, this was a project that received funding from the Gates Foundation um, to help college admissions departments increase their uh, yield and improve the number of students that are matriculating into their, their college. Um, and so this was my first endeavor at uh, entrepreneurship. Um, that was in 2012. Um, two years after that, I joined EBSCO. Uh, and also moved home to my hometown, uh, which is uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. And in the role at EBSCO, I was responsible for um, working with EBSCO libraries that wanted to surface the content and databases inside of third-party systems. Uh, at that point, this was a pretty complex endeavor to make sure that the resources you were paying for um, were able to be accessed uh, um, in systems that EBSCO didn't own. Um, this was a way for me to travel and start to see just how vast um, the library world was. I had clients in 30 countries uh, and met many of you during this time. Um, and this also was when I realized that despite the diversity of research libraries around the world, 
there are also some through lines and some common denominators, despite our size or which country or locale we're in, there are things we have in common. Um, and during this time was when I got the inspiration to um, start thinking about a specific problem that uh, based on conversations was unaddressed. Uh, and that problem is um, managing people in a modern library. Um, and it was really a conversation that began with about nine libraries to ask ourselves, how can we prepare for the future with regard to talent management? Um, how do we rethink the way we recruit people um, to have a more diverse organization? Uh, how do we retain professionals that um, are expecting better service and better support from us as an employer? Uh, and even succession planning, um, which we'll talk about in a moment. And so it was during this um, research and development season where I left EBSCO and um, connected with um, the Dean of Libraries at Boston University Libraries, Dr. K. Matthew Dames, who um, has since moved on to the University of Notre Dame. Um, but I became an entrepreneur in residence uh, at Boston University Libraries. This was the first role of that kind. This was a special opportunity for me because I've always wanted to work in libraries, um, but never quite knew how I could contribute or add value. And um, this was a time right before the pandemic began where um, Dr. Dames and his leadership was looking to um, rethink the way that they managed talent. Um, this was on the heels of them receiving a Mellon grant uh, for professional development and leadership development. And this two year period from 2019 to April, 2021, um, probably was the most uh, formative part of my, my career working in libraries. Um, once the pandemic hit uh, here in the States, which around the same time as everywhere else, um, that's when the libraries we were working with during that research and development phase um, were pretty clear that they wanted us to launch the software that we created. Um, which now today is known as skill type. Um, so today, what I'd like to share is some of the observations and learnings that really motivated us to focus on this, this problem. And it overall does give us a lot of optimism about the future for libraries. And um, I hope that towards the end of this conversation, um, we can have a dialogue about what experiences you've had and whether the trends that we're seeing, are you seeing things differently in your organizations? Um, so preparing for this talk and specifically the Digital Shift Forum, I didn't want to sort of rehash things that I've shared elsewhere. Um, the Digital Shift, as I mentioned at the outset, is uh, unique in the forum's uh, remit. Um, and I started to think about the different contributors that lead us to the moment that we're in right now. Um, from my estimation, there are several. Um, we are all aware that from a collections perspective that the library has already undergone a shift from print um, to digital. I'm working with a library now in Louisiana that will become the um, first uh, fully digital library here in our state. Um, and that's becoming more and more the case where we're getting rid of the books. We are um, freeing up that real estate to um, facilitate better services to, to patrons and researchers. Um, and so this shift has been well underway, but it's certainly a contributor to um, the new skills that people need to operate in the library. Another is with regard to the software that we use. Right when I started uh, my career in libraries, 2008, the software was on premise. Um, the customers we were working with using Ex Libris Aleph, for example, um, they hosted those services. Um, whereas today, I don't know if you'll be able to find a software product uh, that you can host uh, on your own if it isn't open source. 
most of those um, vendor services are all in the cloud. And this transition also contributes to the skills that um, we need to run the library. We no longer need systems librarians to keep servers up as much as we need uh, people who are able to um, work with the vendor that are su supporting that, that cloud-based service. Um, another example is on spending, how we've successfully transitioned from owning all of the materials and resources we collect in the library uh, to subscribing to many of them, uh, with the exception of rare books and special collections, of course. But this transition also contributes to the types of skills that are needed today are quite different from those uh, before uh, this shift occurred. Um, we think about reference and how just during the pandemic, many of our colleagues were trained in reference to support patrons walking right up to the desk. Whereas we've seen that reference is now either 100% virtual and maybe now starting to get back to some hybrid in person, but the skills that are required of a, of a librarian to support patrons virtually or operate a chat bot uh, are different uh, than the ones supporting reference in person. Um, the services that we're providing are shifting and evolving into more research focused services. Um, many of our universities have an office of research. Um, when my parents were going to college and university, there was no office of research. Um, and so this is uh, a new set of skills in the library that one generation ago wasn't there at all. And so this too helps to contribute to how the org chart and the skills needed in the library is evolving. We can go on and on. Uh, the budget uh, is now shifting away from libraries to new offices on campus that didn't exist when the library existed. We think about the Office of IT and CIO and also the Vice Provost for Research, right? These roles and budgets and offices are new and came after libraries did. And with the shift of that budget um, requires new skills in the library to have partnerships with these units on campus. And now we see libraries um, preparing to partner and have strategic partnerships type of skills. And these skills aren't taught in library school. These skills are oftentimes learned on the job or picked up for people who study to receive an MBA perhaps. Um, but these partnership skills are ones that are becoming more important for the library as well. Um, I have a few more here, even though I'm certain you're getting the point that the library and the skills that it utilizes today are quite different from one generation ago. Um, this one deals with how the power dynamic has changed from our parent institutions to commercial vendors. And there's many great um, thought leaders and uh, researchers that are dealing with this exact topic uh, in terms of the consolidation of the publishing industry and the impact that has with the power dynamic. This requires us to have a new skill set in the libraries in terms of vendor relations and um, negotiations um, to make sure that the contracts we sign are ones that are in the best interest of our, um, our uh, library and our unit, but also our, our parent institution. Um, succession planning. Um, this is something that a colleague here in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Stanley Wilder, has done much research on the this idea that the retirements that take place in our industry normally have these five-year cycles. And with the economic downturn in 2009, that normal cycle paused. Um, this idea of quote unquote delayed retirements has created a bubble where people who were supposed to retire haven't. And that then trickles down um, in terms of the number of openings that we are expecting to have are fewer. Um, but we're also working with uh, colleagues having to reimagine the contributions they make 
um, during a, a time when the skills that they accrued um, are no longer um, uh, as uh, heavily utilized as they were when they first joined. And lastly, definitely not least important, the demographic shift. The patrons that we're serving today are literally nothing like the ones that we served a, a year ago. I'm a millennial, uh, Generation Y, and now we're catering to Generation Z. These are born digital natives, people who ever since they were born, they have had access to touch screens and their expectations of coming to the library um, are quite different. And this too impacts the services that we provide and the skills we need to develop. Meanwhile, the demand for these new sets of expertise far outpaces the supply. And this is due to a few reasons. Our colleagues who are administering the information science programs um, around the world sh are struggling to adapt and keep up with the pace and rate of change. I attended a presentation last two years ago at the Charleston conference here in the States where I learned that to adjust the curriculum for an iSchool um, um, course, and to get a new course added into a curricula, get that course officially approved. At this one iSchool, it could take up to 13 different approvals and votes and steps from various committees around the university just to add a new course to an iSchool uh, curriculum. This may be less at, at other iSchools. Perhaps this was an outlier example, but it just opened my eyes to how that model of creating the curricula that librarians need to serve in libraries wherever they work as employment was designed during a time when the rate of change was not as um, um, great. Another example we referred to a few seconds ago has to do with the delayed retirement bubble um, and how the number of openings that we were expecting to have in our organizations um, doesn't match with the reality. Um, and lastly, the training providers around the world, and I'm referring to conference organizers, I'm referring to professional associations, um, even commercial vendors that uh, produce training for their products and services. These groups currently view libraries as funders. They view libraries as a revenue stream. They don't currently view libraries as employers that have needs in terms of skill development that the programming should be in response to. Um, I'll give you a, just a brief anecdote. Um, conferences have calls for proposals that are open calls um, a theme for the conference is decided by a, a, a volunteer, a committee of volunteers and uh, members in the organization. And once those proposals come in, um, the proposals are reviewed by these oftentimes volunteer workers. And there's a several month lag between the time the proposal is submitted to the time the proposal is delivered. And during that time, the material that was submitted is very likely to be outdated, um, especially if we're dealing with presentations and trainings that are with regard to the pandemic and how new information has been flying uh, uh, our way with regard to how to respond to COVID-19, just as one example. And so training providers currently don't have a mechanism or a culture of checking in with libraries as an employer to say, do you need a particular set of skills that you're currently missing? Perhaps we can structure this conference around training and developing that set of expertise. That's not currently the culture. To put a fine point on this, take a look at the number of competencies that since 2010 are brand new. Um, in other words, if there was um, 
uh, a set of competencies that libraries needed before 2010, it didn't include any of these. These are all fairly new um, from 2007 or eight moving forward. Um, and if the iSchool that we attended, we went to school prior to this, these are for the most part skills that we have to learn on the job. Um, we have to find alternative means of acquiring expertise um, in these areas. And this is just from, again, I'm using 2010 as a round date, but 2006 or seven or so is when the first e-resource management system was developed, which was um, a system called Verde, uh, managed by Ex Libris, uh, but didn't wind up moving from development partner phase into a commercial phase. But that was around the time um, when um, this new wave of skills and competencies um, started to come to be. That doesn't keep in mind the new tools um, that were also created because tools also require expertise. We have to operate these products uh, depending on our role which requires us to learn them and read the documentation and, and study, keep up with the new versions and updates to the product. Again, continuing to add on to um, the, the responsibility of managers and supervisors to make sure that our teams have these expertise. And this is still from 2010 and on. And so it sort of asks the question if, there continues to be this rate of change. Um, how are we rethinking the way we acquire these skills moving forward? I'll give you one more example of emerging competencies that are on the horizon now that may not be a part of our um, periphery today, but if we give ourselves five years or three or five years, I'm certain that many of these, if they aren't already in your organizations, are going to be skills that you're going to have to train for and recruit for. Um, there are sort of standout libraries, many of you probably on today's webinar that are already thinking ahead in this area, but we can agree, I'm assuming that that's not the case for the average library. Uh, the average library, for obvious reasons, is bogged down with a number of um, austerity measures and staffing deficits that simply don't enable them to focus on the future as much as putting out fires today. But right around the corner are um, a new world of, um, of, of skills that our patrons will be expecting us to be knowledgeable of. Also, grant funders will be incentivizing us to be responsible for. And there's a few examples I want to provide in terms of real life implications of some of these emerging competencies. Uh, in preparation for today, I decided to stop putting off a deep dive into um, the whole world of cryptocurrency, um, specifically um, also the blockchain and non-fungible tokens or NFTs, which we've probably seen the craze about. And at first I didn't think that there was a relationship between these buzzwords and trends and the services that we're expected to provide to patrons and researchers. But if you just engage with me for a thought experiment, you'll see quickly that there actually are. And for example, these non-fungible tokens or these NFTs are making possible for the first time us to attribute ownership to digital objects um, with great transparency, security, and verification um, because of blockchain technology. And someone in our organization should be thinking about whether this plays a role in special collections. As we digitize our special collections and we seek to make available and accessible um, various uh, rare books and manuscripts, 
are there ways for this new technology to help further our goals? Are there ways for libraries to earn revenue um, from this new technology? Um, I don't have the answers to these questions. This is simply food for thought and an example of how things are changing so rapidly um, and it's worth it for us um, to engage in these conversations. There are many libraries, um, while it's still not the norm, who are engaging in augmented reality, virtual reality. We just saw an announcement from Facebook about these new Ray-Ban glasses that allow them to um, project uh, and sort of have a digital experience as I'm moving around. Well, we hear a lot about the surveillance problems and the privacy implications of these technologies. But if we think for a moment about the patrons that we're gonna be serving in five years, who this is all they've ever known. And as they're walking around the physical space in the library, are we able to create a digital experience for them simply by them having on a pair of sunglasses? And how can we bring the wealth of our collections that are already hosted in the cloud into a virtual or, or augmented experience for, for patrons? Blockchain is a fascinating technology that a few colleagues are already researching. I'm thinking of Sandy Hirsch at the San Jose State I School who's published on this. Uh, Michael Meth, who is now the, the Dean of Libraries at San Jose State wrote a book on this as well in terms of blockchain for libraries. But the blockchain is a digital distributed ledger that can retain the um, knowledge of a contract that multiple parties can sign and we can verify this um, without much dispute. And these smart contracts can have many different um, traits that allow them to be automatically implemented um, at the point of the transaction. Um, I think this is quite amazing for the patron privacy conversation that all of us are passionate about. Um, and the light bulb moment went off for me when I downloaded my first um, cryptocurrency wallet. And I was looking for the moment when the wallet was going to ask me for my name, the wallet was going to ask me for my email address or, or something, and it never did. This digital wallet is something that I'm just using now, and the assets that I'm able to put into that wallet, whether it's an NFT or um, an Ethereum name service address, um, they have no idea that I'm Tony Zanders, but it is verifiable on the blockchain that I own these assets. And it's a fascinating example of how this buzzword, uh, which seems irrelevant to our mission, could possibly be a silver bullet for the privacy conundrum we're in with vendors, because vendors are asking for more information from patrons in order to provide more personalized services. But perhaps we can do that without um, even engaging or maintaining personally identifiable information. Again, I don't know the answers here, but this is just food for thought. And lastly, um, should libraries onboard researchers to this idea of NFTs to help redistribute power from publishers? Um, what I mean here is the non-fungible token or an NFT, which is an object on um, the blockchain, can be any digital asset. Um, if you were to go to a website right now called OpenSeaSEA.io, you can create an account on OpenSea, which is an NFT marketplace. And any of us can start uploading digital assets, whether it's PDFs, JPEGs, as NFTs, and it will turn this PDF into um, a, a non-fungible token on the blockchain with a unique address. And we can then use that unique address to transact and provide access. Um, and is this 
going to play a role in helping to rethink the power dynamic between researchers and, uh, and the publishing community. I don't know, we're still in early days, but these are the conversations that, that I believe we should be having in terms of new skills librarians should have and library workers should have as we provide services to our communities. So I wanna to segue towards the end here and sort of bring us back down from the clouds to acknowledge that we're not out of the woods yet with regard to the pandemic. I was doing some research and came across the House of Commons library paper on the financial impact that COVID-19 is having on higher ed sector in UK. And several things were made clear for those who've read this report, but we're very much so still in the woods with regard to the austerity measures and budgetary uncertainty, um, not just in the UK, but, but, but globally. Um, everyone will be continuing to seek ways to consolidate operations, to improve collaboration, um, which I believe is a great opportunity for groups like RL UK to really shine and make an impact uh, far beyond that which it's already made. And there's also a clear call for an increase in research and development, an increase in experimentation and improving the support of that research, which to me just really highlights the role of the library being well suited uh, for the future. Um, I also came across a report from the publishing community in the UK, which just sort of offered another glimpse of how the publishing community is preparing for the next 10 years and what we can learn from that as we train up for new skills. And this one takeaway here was that the publishing community is seeking to identify more opportunities for digital delivery, more efficient systems, and also greater collaboration. Again, so different part of the broader ecosystem. We have our government and funders, we have our publishers, but they're saying the same thing. Um, greater collaboration among uh, the community. Number two, which stood out to me from this industry update, delivery mechanisms need to be adapted to ensure the right offerings are produced. Um, when I think about libraries and training providers, Right now, there is no shortage of training resources. There's no shortage of webinars that are being had. The question is, how do we present the right training or the right skill development opportunity to the right worker at the right time? Uh, the, the, the delivery mechanisms of the, the, the call for proposals, and then we host all of the trainings behind one website. Well, there's thousands of websites, which have thousands of passwords. And a busy professional doesn't have time to navigate each of those to find the right training resource to work on a particular skill. So the delivery mechanisms do need to be adapted to ensure the right offerings are, are produced. And lastly, from their estimation in the publishing community, leadership is required to accommodate adaptive and, and flexible remote work. Um, this doesn't always apply to institutions that need to be physically present to serve their, their communities. Um, but this too was something that um, we're currently experiencing right now in the, in the library side. Um, um, and we will be moving forward. We're not yet out of the woods on this front either. Um, as I wrap up, I wanna point to what I would describe as some glimmers of hope um, because Many are having conversations around this right now. And one of the sort of encouraging um, insights um, that I've come across was the number of libraries that are prioritizing employee development, talent development, talent management as a part of the strategic plan. Um, it's certainly not the norm and it's not yet even average, but this, I'll share a link to this in some follow-up materials if you're interested, but this screenshot is of a tweet thread um, where I identified about 32 research libraries that are prioritizing employee development and staff development, um, skill development as a strategic direction because none of this will be, um, solved, we won't make progress on any of this, unless 
institutions and library leadership teams make this a priority and name this as a goal. And so it was encouraging to see um, that libraries are starting to do this more and more. Um, 10 years ago, I don't imagine many libraries had um, staff development or skill development as a strategic direction, um, but things are changing uh, and this is something to be optimistic about. Um, also, there are national dialogues that are being had, not everywhere, um, and some are behind others, but um, the fact that we're convening to discuss this today, again, is a huge step in the right direction because it's hard for us to prepare for something that we haven't discussed as a community. Um, not just here in the UK, but you have groups like CLEAR in the US uh, with the Leading Change Institute. Um, right before the pandemic began, my last flight was to Australia to present at the VALA conference there, but also to attend a pre-conference held by a group uh, called CALL on this digital dexterity program. And this was a wonderful conversation before we even knew COVID would change our world about how do we solve the digital skills gap? Um, and there, there's a, a, a robust national dialogue taking place um, in Australia where each library has appointed digital dexterity champions. And these are ambassadors at the library advocating and supporting these types of conversations. Um, and so this too is a glimmer of hope. Um, and then lastly, there are smaller initiatives, not necessarily national in scope, but various um, grants have been uh, awarded, uh, various research is being performed uh, around the world, trying to think differently around skill development and how do we develop a talent strategy that is more collaborative and that responds to a lot of the, the, the trends we're observing. Um, and I'm happy to provide links, uh, citations for, for any and all of this, this material. Um, my last sort of slide here before we open things up are just sort of distilling these things down into some lessons that we've sort of taken to heart and use as we've built out our community and also the skill type software platform, which is that any successful effort uh, as a library community to prepare for volatility or prepare for the uncertain future must follow these six traits in, in, in our opinion. Um, the first is that it has to be community driven. Um, there are so many different local contexts and constraints that there will, won't be a one size fits all solution. Um, and we have to create a mechanism and culture of um, allowing community input or, or library input into these, these solutions. Um, number two is that it has to be privacy centric. There is very strong um, and legitimate concern to the response uh, to modern technology. Um, we see how large um, technology companies go unchecked and abuse their, their power and authority um, by um, either selling third-party data or, or violating uh, people's right to privacy. And this in turn creates general skepticism towards the role technology can play. Um, what we found is that the solution is to have a very clear and privacy-centric approach where everyone is aware of what happens to their data and they're able to opt in and opt out accordingly, um, basically following principles like that of the GDPR in the, in the EU. Um, we also believe that automation will be required. We simply don't have enough resources, enough people to keep up with the pace of change, um, the new skills that are being developed, um, we will have to leverage technology and automate some of the things that um, usually take a, a, a large amount of time to a, a accomplish. Um, we will need to have a global reach. Our local supply of talent and skills and expertise 
aren't sufficient anymore. And I was encouraged to discover that here at LUK, you're already thinking in this direction to develop partnerships with um, various organizations around the world, uh, like CLEAR and others, to um, facilitate this conversation. Um, how can we collaborate better? Um, to do this, we, we will need to think globally um, in our approach. Fifth, we will have to leverage economies of scale. Um, the more institutions and people behind an initiative, it's just going to drive the cost down for everyone, which leads to the sixth, which is that our costs will need to remain predictable. Um, we're no longer in a budgetary scenario where we can sustain the impact of um, unpredictable costs. And so um, these are just six of the things that, that uh, we've learned and identified. And um, I'm thanks, thankful for the time and attention you've given so far. And um, curious to see what thoughts you have about um, this in your, in your local context. Thank you, Tony. I'm afraid you've left me with great anxiety. Um, <laughs> I, 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 it concerns me actually that we're not um, moving quick enough in libraries uh, to pick up on some of those competencies that, that you listed in your presentation. Um, uh, you know, 10 years ago, we were way ahead, but I think we've got, I feel that we've got bogged down and COVID hasn't helped. Um, so I have, I know, three questions that I need to uh, relay to you, um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and there may be somebody who wants to come and, and join us, but I'll start with the questions. So the first one, I think, sort of leads on to, to from what I was just saying, uh, which is about uh, how much is the way forward about it, it, how much is the way forward about upscaling those working in libraries and how much is it about bringing non-library folk in with relevant skills into the library workplace? Um, this is a great question mm -hmm. that um, I personally know uh, library directors who use this mental model to build out their, their strategy. Yeah. Um, the work of the library is more now than ever touching several adjacent um, units on campus. Yeah. And the expertise we need might not be 100% library and information science focus any longer. It might only be 30% LIS and perhaps 70% IT or 60, 40 uh, data in, in research data um, or other combinations. Um, there's a term Alt-AC or, or alternative academic, uh, the nickname Alt-AC, which are dealing with uh, those who have PhDs, um, but who are seeking to gain employment outside of the area of their PhD. And they are very interested in working in libraries. Um, to utilize their experience as a researcher and as an author, um, as a grant writer, um, but to use those for the, the mission of the library. So um, I think it's going to be a balance of, of, of both, um, um, both uh, upskilling those in the library and mm -hmm. recruiting outside. Mm -hmm. I don't believe we'll have the luxury to, to pick one or the other. Okay, so I'll, I'll ask an, an additional question to that, which is around recruitment. How then, uh, and this is from my, my personal experience, how to reach those outside of the library sector if you feel that they might have the skills within, um, to, you know, to bring into a library, how to actually reach them, how to recruit them? Yeah, so the, this, this varies depending on the institution you're in mm -hmm. because the area of personnel and human resources is extremely heavily regulated. Um, I'm referring to the, the actual position description, the job posting, and the rigid format that the document, in order to be approved in compliance, that document oftentimes has to use outdated language in, for compliance purposes. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying that it's wrong, but it is something to consider. The people that we could be recruiting from outside 
may not use the same language Indeed, that yeah. is in the listing or the, the yeah. job posting. And yeah. um, I personally have experience getting frustrated trying to break the position description out of this rigid uh, formula mm -hmm. um, in order to communicate effectively to a potential candidate. And so um, I think this will just require us to get creative, to put on our marketing hats and use some of the tools that we see larger brands around society using to engage with their yeah, audiences. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So something completely different. Are there any digital tools, platforms, or services that are popular now that in your view will decline in the future? Mm, this, this is <laughs> a great one, question. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to just say, I don't know. Mm. Um, most of the stimuli that I've been digesting has been really keeping up with how much we need to, 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 to the, the gap we need to close, yeah. um, to reach out to that 17 year old or that 18 year old who mm -hmm. just stepped foot on campus. And, um, uh, I'm gonna sort of punt this question, but I promise I will think about it and I'll reply, uh, probably on social media, on mm -hmm. Twitter, because I think it's a great question. We, mm -hmm. we need to consider, are there areas that may not be the best use of our limited investment, yeah. um, yeah. in terms of skills? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And if anybody's got anything in terms of what they, what they think, and they could pop that into chat as well. There's quite a lot of nice stuff going yeah. through to chat. Um, okay. Uh, so this is quite specific. Um, it's about your NFTs. What's the relationship between NFTs and persistent identifiers? Um, Anna refers to the NFT as a persistent identifier on steroids, question mark. So, um, each NFT has its own um, persistent identifier of its of its own, hmm. um, and so on a surface level, I could see um, the way that blockchain works being um, an alternative um, for PIDs. Um, the, the NFT is just the, the, as, the digital asset itself, but that digital asset has its own persistent identifier that is, is transparent. Um, you can verify it. You can go to a website called Etherscan and you can search every transaction on the Ethereum blockchain globally uh, in real time. And so um, this is a, a pretty rapidly evolving space uh, that today is catering mostly to software developers and software engineers. The main problem is that they haven't sort of helped non-software developers and non-blockchain engineers imagine how we can apply this technology to non-technical use cases. And this is something that, that I'm advocating for in, in my circles. Um, is to incorporate um, more of us into the conversation, but I have a bias to action. I'm not gonna wait for that to happen. I'd like for us to start our own conversation and not wait uh, and ask ourselves the question, um, are NFTs and blockchain a replacement for these persistent identifiers? Do they solve some of the issues that they, they face? Um, I'm not the expert here. Um, I'm curious to see what thoughts people have, but I, I, I'm, I'm confident this should be a part of our of our dialogue as a community. Okay, you've certainly got interest. Um, uh, pa Paola's asking; she's she's wanting to know more about how NFTs can support special collections. So that's going into a little bit more detail. Sure, um, I uh, purchased my first NFTs this month. I tried to. Uh, share what that experience was. And um, I just got so excited about the potential of our special collections that are in the process of being digitized. Mm -hmm. And 
the ability we could potentially have to add um, a, a monetary value that can be driven by the market on these assets. Um, so if you follow what the fine art community is doing with NFTs, uh, think about auction houses like Sotheby's and, um, and others, and how you have these JPEG files that are selling for $65 million and $2 million, right? These are just digital assets. These are JPEGs. But they allow the market to determine the rarity and the um, demand and value of that asset. Now, some of that on the surface may seem counter to the values of the library because um, some of the, that sort of free market thinking, but there could be a balance, especially during a time when as libraries, we're trying to think about how can we move away from being a cost center in our university to creating our own streams of revenue, right? So these conversations should be held together as we're thinking about how to generate revenue from the library and provide services that can be paid for um, and the role NFTs can play in, in helping us to monetize digital assets that are under our ownership. Right. Uh, David Pross was just posted something about what the British Museum is doing with NFTs. Um, mm. uh, yeah. OK, um, I've, we've got a couple more minutes. I just wanted mm -hmm. to this there's, there's, there's two things. If there's something else comes up, well, one of the um, there's, a, there's a bit on the on the chat about um, uh, about uh, salaries. Uh, particularly when you're looking at the digital side of things um, and that libraries maybe don't pay the right salary to attract brilliant people um, who are currently in the sector. Um, so, you know, for an example, software engineers don't really have a good reason to stay employed in the library. I don't know if that's the same in the US, but it certainly is in, in the is. UK. And, and that's mm -hmm. quite an issue. It is. Um, I think this will my immediate response here is something that we worked on while at Boston University, mm. uh, which is, you know, I'm assuming most of us on today's call are uh, in the university or the academic environment. And one of the unique assets we have is the rich student uh, population and the skills that they bring to the table. Um, if you just to marry these conversations, um, many of the most successful and experienced people in cryptocurrency today mm. are between the ages of 17 years old and 27 years old. And so that is our university demographic. Um, mm. That is the demographic of our mm. undergraduate programs and our graduate mm. schools. And as of today, they are leading the innovation, they're leading the uh, development of these new technologies. And as a library, I believe we have the ability to host and facilitate um, various types of events, whether it be hackathons or um, uh, other types of programs that will leverage the talent we have on campus. Um, because they're studying, they don't have the same financial requirements as uh, our, um, their sort of, you know, adult and other professional counterparts. Yeah. But if we could sort of rethink the role of student work and yeah. student success, there's an interesting opportunity because these students are looking for real world experience, mm -hmm. right? That mm -hmm. While they have been tinkering mm -hmm. as a hobby on the side, are there real world projects that the library has to solve that they can add to their resume, yeah. which can help be a springboard to find employment later. I think yeah. that's a unique competitive advantage of the of the academic uh, environment. Yeah, yeah, great, lovely, Tony. I, we're going to have to wrap things up. Um, uh, we've got one final question here, which I don't know if you want to just do a very quick call to arms. Um, so it's, it's, it's really, are we moving quickly enough? Is there a danger libraries are becoming irrelevant? I think I might have started the uh, conversation like that. So do you, just with it, we've got about a minute left. So, yes, there is a very clear and certain danger that libraries and librarians are becoming are on the verge of becoming obsolete. Mm -hmm. um, we're only one generation away from 
an entire student population of students that will never have stepped foot into a library. Yeah. And however, the reason I'm in this work and I'm committed for the rest of my career is because I'm optimistic that if we can respond to change the way libraries have always responded to change, there has always been a culture of innovation and moving forward, but we have to focus and um, prioritize conversations like this on a more regular basis. Mm -hmm. We need to have roles in our organization that are solely responsible for uh, preparing us for the future. Um, we have to shift from a reactive mode to a proactive mode. Um, maybe it's a committee in the library that is thinking about the future, but um, it's not too late in my estimation. I think this will be the decade that determines the future of the, the, the library profession, um, which is why I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about um, these conversations.